Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. So last time we talked about the Hall effect and the Schmidt trigger and how they worked. The Hall effect uh, switch uses the Schmidt trigger for debouncing. Uh, Hall effect switches are the most common way that you'll see Hall effect devices. And you'll see them in applications like key, uh, keyboards and anti-lock brake systems. We next uh, discussed gyroscopes, the last of the three devices that make up an IMU. A gyroscope is a device used for measuring or maintaining orientation or angular velocity. MEMS gyroscopes rely on the Coriolis effect. Um, in these devices, there's a small mass moved by a spring. And as the sensor moves, the mass inside moves. Uh, so in the diagram here, the sensor is attached to a spinning wheel on the upswing the mass moves to the edge of the disk, and on the downswing, the mass moves towards the center. So similar to an accelerometer, as the rate of rotation increases, um, so does the displacement of the mass, which causes a proportional change in capacitance. In today's lecture, we're going to talk about something a little different. So today's Earth Day. I wanted to talk today about some of the environmental, in environmental impacts, positive and negative, of sensor systems. So Earth Day was actually born right here in California in uh, 1969 in response to a disastrous oil spill in Santa Barbara. And it killed thousands of birds, seals, and dolphins. And this oil spill was special in that it was televised, so people got to see firsthand what it looked like. As a result of that, a senator from Wisconsin had the idea to hold a national teach-in uh, to teach people about environmentalism. So this senator recruited a 25-year-old graduate student who was at Harvard at the time to organize the event, and eventually that turned into Earth Day. So today, some instructors at Santa Cruz are organizing a similar teach-in, uh, very much hearkening back to the original roots of Earth Day. The impact of electronics on the environment maybe isn't something that you've spent a lot of time thinking about. Um, you know, when we think of emissions, we think of cars and power plants and airplanes. But it turns out that the reality is more complex, and electrical engineers have an increasingly significant role to play. So how many of you have heard about the 2021 IPCC report? Oh, a few, so good. IPCC stands for Environmental or Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and it's an, a UN-organized consortium of more than 14,000 scientists across the globe. That's right. 14,000 scientists worked on this report over a number of years. Um, they've re released six editions of it. And the 2021 edition is significant because it strongly links climate change to human actions. Before then, it was you know, arguable. This report definitively has uh, simulations showing what it would look like if humans weren't here and what it looks like now and projects them out. And uh, you know, because it's 14,000 peer-reviewed people, it's a pretty strong case that man-made climate change is a real thing. Um, they also show that greenhouse gas emissions are continuing to rise despite the fact that almost every country in the world in 2015 pledged to limit warning to 1.5 degrees Celsius as part of the Paris Climate Accord. So in short, the pace of action that we've been taking is not enough. Uh, when this report came out, the UN Secretary General warned that the report is a code red for humanity. The alarm bells are deafening, the evidence is irrefutable, and greenhouse gas emissions from fossil fuel burning and deforestation are choking our planet and putting billions of people in immediate risk. Now, the silver lining to all of this is that there is still hope. Uh, it turns out that we can, in fact, avert the, the worst of the impacts if we act swiftly. So that 1.5 degrees, it might be something you've heard in the news a lot, and that benchmark is really important. It's the threshold where we can avert the worst. So far, we, the temperatures have risen 1.1 degrees, and I think it might have gone up another 0 .2, 0 0.1 degree for us to be at 0.2 since the, the report came out. So if we exceed it, we're going to see significantly more damage to insects, for example, which are really important for the pollination of crops. And plants are almost twice as likely to lose half of their habitat if we go up to two degrees Celsius compared to one and a half. Corals, which are in the process of being devastated, would be 99% lost. 
sea level rise would affect 10 million more people by the year 2100 if we warm by a half degree extra. That's going to bring an additional 10 centimeters at the coastlines. And the number affected would be continuing to grow like after that mark. So basically, if we keep growing, it's going to raise 10 centimeters and just kind of keep on going for a good long while. The number, you know, we're going to have like locked in ice melt. So oceans are already suffering from acidity and lower levels of oxygen. So that's impacting our, um, you know, seafood and uh, seaweed diets. One model shows that marine fisheries are going to lose 3 million tons at 3 Celsius, or 2 Celsius, which is twice the decline if we manage to stop it at 1.5. So ice-free summers, so the Arctic, it doesn't have ice-free summers. The Arctic is warming two to three times faster than the, west, the rest of the world. Uh, at 1.5 degrees, the Arctic would be ice-free every 100 years, so pretty bad, but you know, every 100 years. But if you go up that extra half degree, it would be every 10 years. So that little amount makes a big, big difference. And closer to home, of course, many of us here have experienced firsthand the impact of increased extreme weather. In 2020, this campus had to evacuate due to the CZU lightning complex, which is the fire pictured here. This is not abnormal anymore across the western US. Droughts and extreme wildfires have grown more and more common. They damage property and cause significant air pollution, and they impact the health of not just the people near where it's burning, but across the whole region. I think that year, air quality, maybe it was last year, but air quality in New York City suffered because of fires out here. And in Arizona, the wildfire season has started on April 20-something. So it's getting earlier and it's getting worse. So this is a big deal. So all that is pretty scary and a natural question might be, well, you know, what, what can I do to help? What, what is our highest priority? This plot from the EPA shows how emissions are divided across all the sectors in the US. The three biggest contributors, which account for about 75% of all of our emissions, are transportation, electricity generation, and industry. So where do we fit in? The work that electrical engineers and computer scientists do can be broadly categorized as belonging to the ICT industry. ICT stands for Information and Communication Technology. And this encompasses everything from IoT sensor nodes to mobile networks to big data centers. The scope goes from silicon wafers to caching cat pictures in the cloud. So this is our industry. A 2021 study found that ICT accounts for 2 to 4% of the globe's emissions. In fact, our industry actually has higher emissions than the entire aviation industry. That might not look like much compared to, say, the automotive industry, uh, but we have to consider that our technology infrastructure is growing more and more demanding. We want faster speeds, higher resolutions, more dense sensor networks, so if we project things out, it shows that the emissions of our industry are expected to grow as much as 400% in the next 20 years. So that means that the modest 2 to 4% we were just talking about is going to grow to 10 to 20% without substantial preventative action. Yes? Does that graph like count? Because like I assume like electrical engineers are doing a lot of work in the aviation industry and in the automotive industry. Like, is that still lumped in the ICT industry like you're saying? Or? No. So if you're an electrical engineer who's working for an airplane industry, you're probably going to be in the airline industry. So this is more focusing on like Apple or uh, Interdigital or Google, some, something in that stack. Okay. Oh, we want to keep emissions under control. That much is clear by now. So the first part of doing that is figuring out where they come from. The biggest contributors are data centers, so servers, networks, like switches and routers, and user devices like personal computers, phones, tablets, IoT nodes. Estimates vary, but a 2020 study estimates that user devices account for the majority of emissions at 57%. Now, 
for user devices, the majority of the emissions are not actually from the usage phase, meaning not from power used to charge up your phone or your laptop, but due to something called embodied emissions. Embodied emissions are greenhouse gas emissions arising from manufacturing, transportation, installation, maintenance, and disposal of a device. So the embodied emission statistic is particularly concerning because the number of IoT devices in the world is projected to grow drastically in the next few years. Projections estimate that the number of IoT devices will triple compared to 2020 numbers in just the next three years, with there being more than three IoT devices per person in the world. So with IoT devices being one of the fastest growing source of emissions, We've got a problem on our hands. You and I, we work on sensors and embedded systems. Small embedded, embedded devices are the bread and butter of IoT. So hopefully I've convinced you at this point that the work that we do has real impact on the environment and the whole industry should be taking steps to address this. And another thing that we do need to keep in mind is sustainability is not just about electricity and carbon. We still need to keep in mind things like water use, land use, and recycling. When considering water use, collectively data centers are among the top 10 water consuming industrial or commercial industries in the United States. The reason they need this water is primarily for cooling. One unfortunate fact is that data centers are often located in exactly the places with the least water to spare. You'd think that building a huge, ugly data center in the middle of a desert in Arizona or Utah is a good idea until you think about all the water that you need to operate that data center. There's also land use. Removing trees to build reduces carbon sequestration capacity, and many construction materials, like cement, have a high carbon footprint. Recycling is also a very important factor. Only about 17% of the e-waste, so things like obsolete phones, obsolete phones, uh, sorry, obsolete computers, 17% of that is recycled. For every 1 million phones that are recycled, we can recover 35,000 pounds of copper, 770 pounds of silver, 75 pounds of gold, and 33 pounds of palladium. So these are real raw resources that have high value. And when we can recover these, this reduces the amount of mining that we need to do for raw resources. And mining is widely acknowledged to be destructive, particularly if you're relying on mining operations in developing nations, like in Africa, which is where a lot of the mining happens for phones. So we've done step one and acknowledged that there's a problem, so how do we start to solve it? One of the most important steps happening across companies around the world is that, and governments and organizations is that all of these organizations are rapidly pledging to reduce their emissions by some set deadline. The strength and the timeline of these pledges varies. Some targets are the bare minimum, like pledging to go carbon neutral by 2050. Others are more aggressive, like pledging to go carbon zero or zero, sorry, or net zero emissions, or even carbon negative by sometime before 2050, like 2040 or 2030. So these are all some really similar sounding terms. So what, what do they mean? So carbon neutrality means that a company's carbon emissions are reduced as much as feasible and then balanced by offsets. So things like planting trees. If you've ever booked a flight, you might see that some of them let you purchase carbon offsets is to offset the emissions of that flight. So this is kind of one approach that companies take. Net zero emissions means that there are net zero emissions of all greenhouse gases, not just carbon. Uh, there's, uh, it's mostly carbon, but nitrous oxide is, I think, 8% of greenhouse gases, and there's other gases that contribute to global warming. Zero carbon, this one's really hard, means that no carbon was emitted, emitted at all in the first place. And carbon negative means that a company removes more carbon than it emits. Uh, it is through for some of those offsets that I mentioned earlier, like doing things like planting trees, et cetera. There also are investigations into carbon capture. So looking at how we can maybe try to capture carbon in soil, et cetera. 
Carbon release is actually another one of the reasons that's really important to keep the ice caps from melting because as the polar caps melt, they have a ton of trapped carbon. So all the ice that's melting <laughs> releases more greenhouse gases and causes the polar caps to melt even faster. <laughs> it's pretty terrible. So the reason I bring this up is that not all carbon neutrality is made equal. So for example, Vodafone, a European cellular provider, claims that their network is powered by 100% renewable energy, uh, as you can see in their headline here. It sounds great, but when you look at the fine print, it says that 100% of the grid electricity Vodafone uses is certified to be from renewable sources. They have direct power purchase in the UK and Spain, and then they say in Italy, Germany, Ireland, Hungary, Romania, Spain, Greece, Turkey, Czech Republic, they have sourced renewable energy certificates, as well as that being a, a mixture in Albania. So what are renewable energy certificates? These are certificates that are basically like trading cards for renewable energy. It's a market-based instrument that represents legal, legal property rights to the renewableness of the electricity generation. Uh, importantly, a renewable energy credit, or REC, can be sold separately from the actual electricity. So the REC owner has the exclusive rights to make claims about using or being powered with renewable energy, regardless of the actual source of their power. So for example, where this comes in is that grids, they can't usually separate renewables versus non-renewables. They just accept it from the plants, however it's coming in. So customers get a mix of whatever it is, which could be 95% coal and 5% solar. So what RECs do is you can buy a REC if you're running on this network to claim 100% renewable power by buying the 5% of that generation that came from solar, when in reality, you're still being powered by 95% coal. So it's a pretty... Um, <laughs> interesting idea of being completely 100% renewable, right? <laughs> so, you know, we saw that earlier, they actually have direct power purchase agreements in the UK and Spain. Vodafone is only truly renewable in those two places. In the rest of the UK, they've purchased the portion of the power that they get that's green. So for example, about 50% of the energy in Germany's grid is non-renewable, and 25% of it is still coal. So what is the path towards being more sustainable in ICT? So first, the highest priority is to prioritize truly renewable power generation, not just based on RECs. We all use power, so this is probably the single highest impact step that we can take. In the US, more than 60% of our electricity still comes from fossil fuels, and only 21% comes from renewables. In fact, as of 2021, more of our energy is coming from coal than renewables, which is pretty sad. I think coal is 1% higher than renewables. And next, number two, is to use the energy more efficiently. In general, we're actually pretty good about this because power costs money, so energy efficiency is better for the bottom line. But there's still quite a bit of room for improvement here. Third is to consider construction and cooling impacts. Construction materials have different impacts and cooling consumes both power and water. Finally, to address embodied emissions, we want to look at transitioning to something called a circular economy. So prioritizing renewable power. We see here overall that our industry's carbon footprint is strongly linked to power consumption with some lower correlation in the devices portion due to the embodied emissions that we've been talking about. Transitioning to renewable energy is the clear and simple answer here. We know exactly how to do this. We have the technology to do it. The problem is just doing it. It requires investing a lot of money into generating renewables and politically, it can be pretty unpopular to shut down coal plants in places like West Virginia, where people still depend on those jobs. So unfortunately, we've been dragging our feet on transitioning US power grids to be more renewable. An example of some of the work that's being done in this area is an NSF-funded research project on carbon-aware data center workload management. This project seeks to create algorithms 
for optimizing workload management for reduced carbon emissions. The idea behind this is that the carbon intensity of our power production fluctuates significantly. Renewable energy production is d uh, driven by factors outside our control. So, you know, how windy the weather is, how cloudy it is, whether or not it's currently night or day. Simultaneously, the load on the grid is also time dependent. So at 3 a.m., most people are sleeping, so the power draw is commensurately lower. Then as we wake up, we begin drawing power, and then as the sun sets but we're still awake, we need even more power to turn on our lights and watch Netflix. There's also seasonal variation. Very hot or very cold temperatures require us to heat or cool our environments, and those requirements are getting more and more drastic as climate change happens. Some of you might be aware of how PG&E sometimes has strategic rolling blackouts during the summer. How many of you recall that? And that, the reason those happen is uh, to reduce demand on the grid, largely due to air conditioning. So the idea behind this research work here I'm talking about is to have data center computing workloads chase renewable energy to, by adjusting where they happen or when they happen, or potentially both. So for example, a workload that's initiated in the Midwest might be moved to the east or west coast to take advantage of renewable wind energy um, when those power grids have a lower carbon intensity. Or a time-sensitive machine learning training workload might be deferred until there's a sudden influx of renewable power. So it's not high priority, so you put it on the back burner until you have extra oomph to do that work with. The idea behind this work is pretty intuitive, um, but as always, the devil is in the details. Moving workloads incurs migration costs, so the algorithm needs to make sure that the benefits outweigh the costs and that baseline performance targets, like latency and throughput, can still be met. Uh, the project is called RIPIT, which is a pretty terrible acronym, standing for Right Place, Right Time, and it's a collaboration between the University of Chicago, UC Santa Barbara, and the University of Wisconsin. I heard a talk from these authors recently, and their preliminary work was showing that by simply moving where workloads occur, you can save between 10 and 17% in carbon uh, emissions. And this is just kind of the very beginning of what they're trying to do. So here we go. Oh, what just happened? This is an example of what some of this fluctuating carbon um, intensity looks like in grids across the US. So yellow is California. Red is the Southwest, and green is the Midwest. We see that California actually is kind of ahead of the game on emissions. We have one of the lowest uh, emissions overall, but the Midwest also has periods where their green bar disappears, and that means they're 100% renewable at that time. So they have zero emissions. Now, ideally, we'd like to see 100% of our electricity be 100% renewable. But to achieve computing workloads that we're used to, we probably need to learn to work with the environment to distribute the workloads to where more power is just inherently available. So that's what that research is working on. And uh, you know, although transitioning to renewable energy is the highest priority, we still have room for progress in energy efficiency. So for example, turning off unused or underused cell towers can reduce power consumption by 87%. This represents a significant opportunity because cellular base stations consume about 60% of the power across the entire cell network. So being able to strategically put cells to sleep or power them down is going to lead to an overall power savings in mobile networks of more than 50% during low traffic times, which is huge. Yet, at the moment, very few cell providers are able to dynamically turn base stations on and off in response to real-time demand. So this type of energy optimization, although it's simple, we should be clearly aggressively pursuing it. And there's going to be ways to save power across the entire industry. You know, can you make an algorithm run more efficiently? Even if it's just 1% or 10% more efficient, if millions or billions of people or devices are using this algorithm, then the impact adds up. Third is considering construction and cooling impacts. So when considering your building plans, minimizing concrete or looking for lower carbon concrete recipes will have a surprisingly high impact. The concrete industry, uh, at least 
8% of global emissions is caused by the concrete and cement industry. They're slowly looking for solutions to this problem. Um, but transitioning, by transitioning to low carbon fuels uh, for the heating mixture, this could eliminate the need for the, uh, the, the fossil fuels to heat it up. And so concrete is mixed by adding together like sand and gravel and cement and water. And where the carbon comes in is you have to heat it all up to a really high temperature, uh, 1400 degrees C. And the easiest way to do that is to burn something that burns very hot, namely fossil fuels. So in addition to looking at recipes where you don't have to turn up the temperature as much, um, scientists are also looking, could you use techniques like induction to potentially turn this into an electrified process? Which, it's not immediate, you know, because our grid isn't decarbonized, but if assuming that we can decarbonize our electricity, then electrifying as much as we can makes sense in the long run. That is why the Caltrain, uh, you may have heard of the Caltrain electrification project, that's why it's been aggressively pr pursued by the state of California. Currently, the trains are diesel. They've been trying to electrify it for a number of years. I think they might be close. And long term, the grid in California and elsewhere is going to be renewable. So the train is no longer going to be a contributor to emissions. Another consideration, which we talked about a little bit, is again cooling. You know, as we talked about, it's the top 10 uses of water in the United States. So there's some actually really interesting ideas being explored in this space. One possibility is leveraging geothermal cooling by locating data centers underground or partially underground. Underground temperatures um, at 10 to 20 meters hold a steady temperature between 50 and 60 degrees Celsius. This can be used as a combination of cooling and heating, generally climate control. So if you live somewhere in the upper parts of the you know, Arctic ring, a lot of the indigenous houses were actually sod houses built into the sides of a hill. And that's because it made it a lot easier to heat them during really cold winters. So going back to that kind of OG idea, we can put our data centers underground and use things like heat wicking and geothermal pumps to leverage lower ambient temperatures. So um, that means that you need to use less energy to bring the internal temperature of the data center to the temperature it needs to be. So you know, if you've got the environment doing the work for you, you need to put less energy into the process. And as a bonus, if you've got things underground, now you can take that land that was previously a super massive, ugly building and plant a bunch of trees on top of it, which serves to sequester carbon even more. Um, so this sounds like a great idea. The downside, of course, is that it's more expensive to build. <laughs> so what have companies like Microsoft and Google been doing? They are two major players in the data center space. So they have a couple of interesting things that they've been working on. Google uses a Go champion to optimize their cooling. So you've all heard of Go, the board game that's uh, kind of like, uh, I don't know how to describe it. <laughs> it's like an Eastern chess. Um, the 2016 Go World Champion AI, AlphaGo, was repurposed to predict future data center temperatures and pressures and make cooling decisions. So deep neural networks were trained on data like temperatures, pressure, power, and set points collected by thousands of sensors deployed across the data centers. So again, this is becoming relevant to what we do because we're learning exactly about how to deploy and collect data from these sensors. The resulting optimized cooling algorithm achieved a 40% reduction in energy needed for cooling across the data center. The caveat with that, of course, is it's um, kind of like a chicken and an egg. Training AI in the first place requires significant amounts of power. So again, this is where the transition to renewables becomes important because if you know that the electricity you're using to train the AI is renewable, it's a little better. Now, Microsoft, on the other hand, took a totally different approach by literally submerging data centers under the sea. It's like geothermal cooling, but underwater. The project is called Project Natick, and they also have a Project Natick 2. And they deployed a 2.4 meter diameter cylinder, so it's pictured, underwater with uh, 12 racks of servers. And they ran real data center workloads successfully for multiple years. 
So Natick 3 is rumored to be in progress, and competitors are already deploying underwater data centers in locations like China and Korea. Step four is transitioning to a circular economy. Has anyone ever heard of a circular economy before? We've got a couple, three, I think. So, circular economies are economic systems that are regenerative in which uh, resource input, waste emission, and energy leakage are minimized by slowing, closing, or narrowing material or energy loops. So the way this is achieved through long-lasting design, maintenance, repair, reuse, and manufacturing, including refurbishing and recycling. So the current economic model that we have is linear, and it's based on something called a make-take-waste-dispose model. It takes a considerable amount, it makes a considerable amount of waste and pollution in favor of speed and affordability. So, you know, styrofoam, throwing away your plates so instead of having to wash them, et cetera. This is a prime example of make-take-waste single-use water bottles, again. So um, 2020 global study predicts that, or estimates that 54 million metric tons of electronic waste were generated in 2019, and 80% of that headed to a landfill. And unfortunately, as that e-waste disintegrates, it releases toxins and chemicals. So by transitioning our manufacturing and life uh, cycle to a circular approach, we're going to greatly reduce the amount of waste produced because we're collecting back the raw materials and using them again. Um, it also reduces the disruptive raw mineral mining that we need to do in the first place. It's probably unlikely that it'll ever be completely circular, especially as populations grow, but if we only have to do a little bit of raw material sourcing, that's really helpful. But by transitioning our electronics to this approach, the primary challenges are that the majority of what we use is not yet designed to be recyclable. So plastics, for example, they have typically a limited number of recycles that you can do on them. The glass, you can recycle it almost indefinitely. Aluminum foil, aluminum can be recycled almost indefinitely. But many plastics, they degrade every single time you try to recycle them. So plastic-based components, they're really hard to reuse. And second, you know, in addition to the materials and the design of the devices in the first place, the things that we can recycle, th the technology is not yet advanced enough to make circular approaches more cost effective than simply disposing used materials and sourcing new ones. So unfortunately, it's cheaper to buy new things than to recycle. So, this step is the most important for addressing embodied emissions. Since the majority of the emissions from this part of the industry come from the manufacture phase. And this is one of the more challenging steps because it requires action across a broad swath of society. Consumers, manufacturers, retail sales locations, municipal recycling facilities. You know, how many people recycle their phones? The phone recycling rate is really low. If the phone is recycled, why is it going to where it needs to be? Can we actually take use of that? Are municipalities investing in technology to advance the state of recycling? The city of Santa Cruz, for example, does not have compost, despite the fact that it actually became illegal in California to not compost food waste. I think they have um, a one-year extension to get it implemented. But it's a little surprising, considering the reputation Santa Cruz has for environmentalism. And this is a prime example of where the people who run municipalities are having a huge impact in what we can do with our waste streams. So important challenges that need to be addressed include designing devices in the first place to be inherently recyclable. Updating the materials we use. Can we design plastics to be more recyclable? Can we have PCBs and other electronics materials use plant-based plastics to reduce, reduce reliance on petroleum and fossil fuel-based uh, plastic? Could we design them to potentially be biodegradable? So if we don't recover something and it does end up in, in a landfill, will that plastic gracefully degrade over time? And of course, we have to improve the e-waste recycling rates. You know, 
it's a step to get everything in one place, if, even if we need you know, to figure out better ways to deal with it. Uh, we have to get people to form better habits with recycling e-waste. We have to get more action with cell phone sellers to encourage and incentivize people to be recycling cell phones and other devices. There aren't any penalties. Um, basically, there's not a good incentive to recycle things right now. So one example of a device company taking major action to change the state of this field is Apple. They're working on transitioning to a circular economy. Five years ago, they announced the ambitious goal of making all new iPhones, Macs, and other products from 100% recycled or renewable materials. As part of that, they built Daisy, which is a phone disassembling robot to take apart up to 200 phones an hour. And as of 2021, 20% of all materials used in Apple products were recycled. So this is good progress, considering that they maybe started from zero. Um, but 20% is still 80% away from 100%, so, and it's been five years. So th that goes to show you that this is a really challenging problem, and hopefully they continue to make a lot of progress in this space. And let's see if this um, video works. It's a 45-second clip of Daisy in action. There's music, but it doesn't matter. So that one was from 2018. They actually uh, released a new video today or yesterday, uh, but that one was like five minutes long, so <laughs> I'm not showing that here. So now that we've done step one and acknowledged the problem, and we've started to talk about how to solve it, are there some ways that we can use technology itself to help solve the problem? So this chart, this chart shows the drastic positive impact that telecommuting can have on emissions. So during the pandemic, emissions immediately and drastically dropped five to seven percent when we stopped commuting during during the pandemic due to lockdowns. You know, we don't want more lockdowns, but this demonstrates how technology enabled us to keep getting things done without having to commute. So can we take this principle and apply it to other high impact sectors? Assuming that we can keep the embodied emissions in check, sensor networks and IoT have the power to make positive impact. So examples include monitoring emissions of vehicles and suggesting ways to reduce it, occupational monitoring for smart HVAC and lighting, so you can turn out lights and use lower energy climate settings when nobody's in the room, agricultural sensing to conserve water, as we talked about a couple weeks ago, Sensor networks to provide early detection for natural disasters like wildfires or landslides, or even gunshot detection to prevent poaching in African wildlife reserves. That last one was done by a company called ShotSpotter that deploys microphones in an, uh, across areas to triangulate gunshots. Their primary business is detecting gunshots in cities, but a few years ago, they were approached by Kruger National Park in South Africa about using their technology to detect, to detect poaching and prevent it. Uh, I was actually an intern there at the time that they first started exploring it, and they had a lot of interesting challenges getting this ramped up. One of them was the fact that elephants actually like scratching their back on trees or posts. So when they deployed the sensors, the elephants kept knocking them over. <laughs> So that was one thing that they had to figure out, is how to kind of elephant-proof the sensors that were supposed to save the elephants. <laughs> uh, the classic example of how the real world can throw a wrench into even the best lab results. Anyway, they, apparently they kept at it, and eventually the technology was so effective that poaching declined in the national park by nearly 60%. So this is uh, kind of an open question with no right answers. How many 
of you can think of other ideas for how you could use sensor networks to improve conditions across the world. I'm curious to hear what people have in mind. Steven? I think for areas like this, like wave generation, that could be huge. And then maybe being able to detect where to put your wave generating sources, like on a day to day, on where the actual swell is hitting. That's helpful. Wave generation. And what problem does that solve? Well, I just think like decentralizing power grids for sustainability is huge. Like, you know, obviously I don't think wind is the best like approach for Santa Cruz, but it probably is for the Midwest. But here, there's like a natural abundance. Wave generation compared to other areas? Mm, mm -hmm. So wa generating power by waves and using sensors to optimize for where the best waves are? Yeah. Nice. What's your name? Cool. Any other cool ideas or things that people have heard of? Well, if you happen to think of one, raise your hand, shout it out. Um, so this is another case study. Here's a, a Bay Area company that does sensing, and part of what they do implements emissions monitoring and reduction. Samsara is an IoT company that's HQ'd in San Francisco, and they develop devices and software to track fleets of vehicles and other equipment. So here's some statistics from their deployment in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. So that city has over 1,700 vehicles in their municipal fleet, and all of them are equipped with the Samsara sensors. And the platform that their software and firmware engineers made enables uh, reporting of emissions and detects engine fault. So those features were used to reduce vehicle idling by 20% and decrease vehicle downtime by 28% by detecting um, engine problems before the users tended to report them. It also led to a 5% reduction in fuel costs, never mind the fact that emissions were inherently reduced by 20%. The city also uses the sensor platform to do real-time vehicle tracking. And this enables them to answer more practical questions like how close is the ambulance that I just called or more mundane things like, oh God, the water is leaking. Please send somebody to shut off the water main. How soon will they get here? Fort Lauderdale is also having problems with a specific historic bridge. Um, it was about 100 years old, and it's one of the kind that detaches from the banks and rotates to let ships through because they're a water community. And uh, unfortunately, in a typical fall, the, bridges were the bridge was closed for two to three months due to overweight vehicles consistently ignoring the posted weight limits. And when that happened, the citizens were forced to take an annoying and fuel inefficient three mile detour around the bridge. So the city uh, improved enforcement on weight limits by tagging overweight vehicles in the municipal fleet, like garbage trucks and such. And now they were, um, the employees were being tracked when they crossed the bridge. Before, nobody admitted to it, but it turns out there were a lot of people going across the bridge. And the instance of overweight vehicles going over the bridge dropped by 90%, and the um, maintenance costs and operability of the bridge have since improved. So, you know, this is a real company that's doing real sensor work that has actual impact on the environment around the United States. So, at this point, you've heard a lot, and a lot of it might be new. So, you might still be wondering, well, what can I do to help? My advice is that while personal action is always helpful, industry-wide change has higher impact, and consumer and employee pressure does change businesses. That Vodafone announcement in the EU with 100% renewable power, that came about because EU citizens were bugging them consistently, saying, why aren't you more renewable? Why aren't you more renewable? Why aren't you more renewable? And uh, finally, they caved. And this is true across all of Europe. European cellular providers are ahead of the game in renewable power compared to 
other locations around the world, primarily due to consumer pressure. What you can do is ask companies, whether you're interviewing with them or working there already, what are they doing to solve the problem? Show up on your first day. If there's a meet and greet with the CTO, ask a direct question. What, what is our company doing to help solve XYZ? And now you have some of the lexicon of where the problems might be coming from. If you work for a device company, ask how they're addressing embodied emissions. If you work for a software company, ask about the data centers or how they're encouraging developers to have more efficient software. See if companies have an ESG team. It stands for Equity, Sustainability, and Governance. And ask how well the company is sticking to the goals that the ESG team sets for them. This is something that bigger companies tend to have. If you're working for a startup, they're probably not going to have an ESG team. But any of the big companies, Apple, Facebook, VMware, Qualcomm, they're going to have an ESG company. If you're an employee, look for opportunities to incorporate sustainability into your job role. So for example, spend some time doing energy profiling to find the lowest power algorithm. And finally, you can simply spread the word. How many of you learned something that you didn't know today? Good. So now you can all take that knowledge and spread awareness of the fact that ECE students and professionals have an important role to play in saving the Earth. Well, with that, today's special Earth Day lecture is over. Oh, a reminder that Lab 2 is due in a week, so keep chipping away at that. And on Monday, we'll start off talking about orientation and navigation. <laughs>